Something that Donald Trump was watching on the television last night very much upset him and led to him making an angry post. I'll show you clips that uh, must have been what got on her skin. But first, here's the post. The ratings challenge to Bill Maher on his increasingly boring show on HBO is really having a hard time coping with Trump derangement syndrome. He's a befuddled mess, sloppy and tired, and every conversation with bnc list guests seems to start with or revert back to me. That's because you're... <laughs> That's because you're one of the two candidates, bubby. This week, he had dumb-as-a-rock bimbo Stephanie Rule from MSDNC on the show, along with a Trump-hating loser, Brad Stevens, who seemed totally confused and unsure of himself. Very much like Mar himself, Stevens should find himself another line of work because I am driving the failing New York Times absolutely crazy, and it's very hard, perhaps impossible for a writer to write well of me without suffering the wrath of the degenerate editors who, with a push from the top, have gone insane. They apologized to their readers in 2016 for their complete and total miss, and they'll do it again in November. The failing New York Times is a badly run newspaper that has totally lost its way. Put it to sleep. Oh my gosh. So another call for a media outlet that doesn't like to go bye-bye. So with that being said, here's what got under his skin. So two media people here today. I thought maybe we would talk about rhetoric because that's what's on Trump's mind. He got shot at again, and he says, um, their rhetoric is causing me to be shot at. And then, of course, in true Trumpian fashion, always the most unself-aware person in the universe, goes on to say, when they're the ones that are destroying the country. <laughs> Which would be also the kind of rhetoric that would make a borderline person shoot at you. But, I mean, he's right, rhetoric has consequences. But he is possibly the worst person to make this case. Yeah, I mean, it's the pot calling the kettle black. I think that's what the expression was 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 basically born for. I mean, for. he's used This it. is the guy who called the media the enemy of the American uh, people. Scum, vermin. All these, all, all these phrases. Now, he's of course, he's absolutely right of that we probably should tone it down. When we're calling our opponents the end of democracy, the end of Western civilization, we're not helping our arguments. Um, I disagree. I disagree. That's that's a dumb argument. I think because you what? No, you ha it, there, that's their argument, which is that you guys are saying Trump is a threat to democracy, but he is a threat to democracy. The answer can't be that we can't say what's true. I want to say what's true, and the left has to do that too. No, I'm sorry, but every time the left calls Trump a threat to democracy, Americans remember that in 2016. Guys like me were calling Trump a threat to democracy, and here we are. I don't and think he was I, then. He and that is. dog and that dog is not going to hunt. You have to say the case against Trump is that he's going to be a terrible president who's going to divide the country, that is going to accomplish absolutely nothing, that is going to embarrass us in front of of, of the world, uh, and but, is going to conduct a miserable on, foreign Fred, policy. But those are policy questions. You don't stop yeah. calling out the truth because people aren't listening. Right? When Donald Trump tells lie after lie, you don't say that nobody seems to care. It's our job in the media, right? When people complain, Donald Trump got fact-checked way more than Kamala Harris did. You're damn right he did. You know why? He told more lies. That was from last night's edition of Real Time with Bill Maher. He had on Brett Stevens, a conservative columnist, and Stephanie Rule, of course, an MSNBC host. And I want to bring in to respond. I have more clips to play for you. Josiah from the Pondering Politics channel. Great, as always, to be with you, Josiah. Likewise, Luke. So in the wake of the second assassination attempt against Trump, You've heard this argument from MAGA that that proves that the left or anyone who believes this shouldn't describe Trump as a threat to democracy. And what I've been saying on my show a bunch, and I'm sure you've been saying similar things, is we should absolutely oppose political violence, denounce it when it happens. We want Trump to have the Secret Service protection that he needs to be safe, etc. But that's a pretty preposterous argument to be saying that because a lunatic and wanted to hurt Trump, we shouldn't accurately describe his record and his rhetoric and how that could damage our democracy. No, 100%. And I've actually been really pleased that Democrats so far, both elected Democrats and uh, you know, left-wing liberal progressive 
pundits and commentators, ourselves included, have resisted the call to do that because I think in times past it would have been tempting to fold to that asymmetric demand of civility politics. Um, yes, I, we totally condemn political violence. Um, uh, as part of an advanced democratic republic, Luke, we, we forfeit any sort of claim to vigilantism, political or otherwise, no matter how it may feel at the time to people, no matter how much they think something's morally justified, it's just unacceptable. Uh, there's, November, there's an election, excuse me, coming up in November, and that's the way to defeat Trump. And we also have the criminal justice system as well to hold Trump accountable um, uh, for his various crimes. And I would argue that these things are actually linked. We need to defeat him in November so that he is no longer, he can't be president, and then he is uh, more susceptible, more accountable to the criminal justice system. But yeah, it's a ridiculous argument. And one, by the way, Luke, that they never hold themselves to. They never hold themselves to that standard. And that, that if nothing else, makes it unacceptable to me. It's remarkable. I understand why emotions for MAGA folks would be running really high. They're outraged. I, I empathize with that. And thus the irrationality of saying, this is why you can't call Trump a fascist when just recently he keeps calling Harris a fascist. And I get that you're saying, well, in this case, someone's going after Trump, but times when violent attackers have gone after Democrats, y'all haven't called for toning down the rhetoric. So the inconsistency is definitely upsetting. And then something I keep coming back to on my show, Josiah, is, is sort of a call to MAGA. If you believe we are being unjust, overly provocative, and promoting violence, even though we clearly oppose violence, but even if that's your belief and you think the reason or the adjustment we should make is no longer calling Trump a threat to democracy, then I pose to you, how do we describe someone who lost an election, refused to leave office until a bunch of his schemes failed, like trying to get fraudulent electors counted by his vice president? When his vice president said, no, I'm not going to do that, he reportedly told an aide while January 6 rioters were chanting, hang Mike Pence, that Mike Pence deserved that. He refused to call the mob off, other times calling local election officials, trying to get them to engage in fraud to push them over the edge in states, since then calling for the termination of the Constitution, saying the government should go after media outlets that he doesn't like, calling media outlets he doesn't like criminals. What do you describe that as? How, how, do, we, how do we describe that if not the language we're using? Because I'm open to suggestions, but I haven't heard a rational explanation for for if we're doing something wrong, what we would describe those actions as otherwise. Yeah, so the, the honest answer is, Luke, that they don't want you to talk about any of that. That's, that's out of bounds. That's not fair game. Uh, either they would reject the premise outright. They would say, well, he won the election. It's just you, you liberals, you stole it from him. Or they would just say, because shut up, because don't talk about it. And what's interesting is, you, you know, you and I just collaborated uh, for a segment on my channel about a, a conversation between Piers Morgan and Jordan Peterson. Now, Piers Morgan also recently hosted a U.S. politics panel in the aftermath of that second assassination attempt. And the most recent one uh, had Cenk Uger, host of The Young Turks, on. And this, this, this part came up uh, in which uh, Cenk was basically asked, you know, ha shouldn't Democrats like tamp down the temperature or, or tone down the uh, the rhetoric. And he said the same thing to Piers Morgan, like, no, we can condemn violence, and, and but we need to call Donald Trump what he is. We need to describe him as the facts represent. And his question was, and he never got an answer from Piers Morgan, never, not once, exactly what you asked. If you want me, how, how do you want me to describe him? What is permissible for Democrats to describe him. And for me, Luke, the fact that Piers could not answer that question or would not answer that question is telling because the implication is they have no good answer. And the real answer is they don't want you to talk about this major vulnerability of Trump's, which is that he is an authoritarian who tried to overturn an election. That is still a polling issue for which Donald Trump is exceedingly vulnerable. So they are cunningly weaponizing this issue to try to disarm Democrats. And that's why I say going all the way back, I am proud that you and I and others and elected Democrats are not backing down from that, that we are not giving into that pressure. Next clip. This is kind of interesting, again, I don't think a lot of people uh, know this. I didn't before a couple of days ago when it was brought to my attention. Uh, crypto, first of all, Trump is getting into the crypto business. I mean, right there, can you imagine Kamala 
saying, I'm, I'm getting into the crypto business. I, I mean, it, it, no, it just, it's just unimaginable what he gets away with. Okay, so he's getting into the business with some guy who used to be in the colon cleanse business. <laughs> it's called shitcoin. No, I, 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 Thank you. Thank you. I, thank you. Uh, but almost half of the corporate political contributions this cycle are from crypto. I did not know this. Uh, and now, here's the thing. The Federal Reserve wants to make a, their own central bank digital currency, CBDC. I don't know what that stands for, but of course, this is exactly why the people who have crypto don't want what don't want. They don't want regulation of any kind, which is why it's used completely by criminals. And so it's perfect for Trump. He's a criminal. Um, so a lot there. Mainly, I wanted y'all to see that clip because just I we haven't talked about this. But what were your thoughts of Trump getting into the crypto biz? It's a good point from Bill Maher that that it's it, it is fitting for Trump. Sort of the grifty nature of a lot of these endeavors, as well as the criminality sometimes that's involved. Well, it's also it's also um, I guess inevitable in two respects. Number one, Donald Trump will, will do anything in a desperate attempt to expand his wealth. Uh, very often it backfires. But number two, think of the association between Trump support and the, the Silicon Valley crypto tech bro, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like the associations there in the first place. So Trump is, is only strengthening the incestuous relationship between that corner of American life and Trump support. Um, but again, I think it's fair to say, based on what we've seen of of Truth Social and its ever declining stock performance, um, I wouldn't trust Donald Trump's instincts in this respect. I know I said, I called out to MAGA in a previous segment, listen, we disagree on a lot. I still want the best for you. Don't do it. Don't invest your hard earned treasure. We saw how that worked for people who invest in Trump media. That's not going well. This is an even more volatile industry for Trump to be getting into. So be mindful at the least you just, of investing in that. You just don't understand his 4D chess, Luke. <laughs> it's going down because, listen, once you once you go down to a certain point, all like that's left to do, it'll bounce. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you just don't see it, Luke. You, have, you don't have the faith. <laughs> uh, and then World Liberty Financial, it's called. And it's so interesting seeing Trump talk about this subject. I don't know if you've seen these clips. There's this one with Maria Bartiromo that I played a bunch of times because she says, you've said that as a part of your campaign and if you were president, you want to expand the role of cryptocurrency in American society. How would you do that? The question's how, okay? And he responds with, oh, we do it. We do it. A lot of smart people are in this space. We do it. Okay, but how she asks a follow-up to her credit and he goes oh it'd be easy we're already doing it china's doing it if we don't do it china's gonna do it and we gotta do it better than china's gonna do it he never explains what it is what's gonna be done to the it he just says he's the best at doing it gross and and clearly he doesn't know what he's talking about with this can, can i ask you luke when 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 People who are nominally on Trump's side ask him these questions. How? When, when they ask him a question that starts with that word, it makes me wonder sometimes, maybe they are trying to sabotage him. They have to know. They have to know he cannot answer a question that begins with the word how. So I'm curious, what, what's going on there? Is Maria Bartiromo secretly a supporter of Vice President Kamala Harris? Is she just setting Trump up for failure? What, I think the, sometimes these hosts forget who they're working with, and they want to come off like they're having, see, Trump can have intellectual conversations. Trump, how would you lower childcare costs? And then he goes, and they're probably internally shocked by, by how incapable of explaining things he is. Uh, we do have another clip. You can go ahead and play, Jaden. It's not too much to ask Kamala, say, are you for a Palestinian state if Hamas is going to run that state? Okay. Yes or no? And let's say you don't like her answer. Are you going to vote for Donald Trump? No, I'm not. Kamala I just Harris said I'm not going to vote for her. is not running for perfect. She's running against Trump. We have two choices. And so there are some things you might not know her answer to. And in 2024, unlike 2016 for a lot of the American people, we know exactly what Trump will do, who he is, and the kind of threat he is to democracy. I don't know So her. it's unclear to me how they're 
be an Stephanie, informed... The problem that a lot of people have with Kamala is we don't know her answer to anything, okay? But you know and his I think answer I, I, to everything. And, and that's why I would never vote for him and people shouldn't vote for him, but people also are expected to have some idea of what the program is of the person you're supposed to vote for. You're just not supposed to say, well, you have to vote for Y because X is this, that, and the other. Let's find out a little bit more. And I don't think it's a lot to ask her to sit down for a real interview as opposed to a puff piece in which she describes like her, her feelings of growing up in Oakland with nice lawns. Then I would just say to that, when you move to Nirvana, give me your real estate broker's number and I'll be your next door neighbor. We don't live there. I, feel, I mean, you're, I feel like you're, you're the dog we're trying to get in the car to go to the bed. You know? <laughs> you, <laughs> you, ouch. <laughs> You're, you're, that tongue on your head for the rest of the day. I say that as one of your biggest fans, you know. I mean, I gobble up everything you write. I just don't understand how you, you get to this place. But, okay, let's, let's not badger. Um, but do you know, for the last two weeks, I've been going on and on. Like, I can't figure out where undecided voters, where informed undecided voters are. I'm like, who's the person who has a list on their refrigerator of, like, well, she said this, and he said, I'm like, who right. is this person? And then I opened the New York Times three days ago, and it's you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so again, a lot there. I sort of want to address with you, Josiah, because some of this we already talked about, the threat to democracy stuff. And, and of course, Harris still has a lot of questions that she needs to answer and policies that need to be laid out. And that's just a part of her getting in the game so late. And it's not an ideal scenario, but it's the one that we're working with. And she is doing more and more interviews. She did the NABJ, did this town hall thing recently. But, but what bothers me on a more petty level is here Brett Stevens, but you see it with Chris Christie too. People will acknowledge all the reasons why Trump cannot be president and then do this weird thing where they go, but I'm, I'm not ready to endorse Harris. He can endorse Harris and still critique her. I endorse Harris and think she needs to still answer on certain policy subjects. Cool. There are times she's delivered answers to questions that weren't perfect weren't ideal and i still think she should be president she's much better than trump etc why i think is because it makes people feel special but why do people like chris christie who know trump's a threat to democracy who know harris is better do this weird but i'm not ready i still need to be wooed over more i'm not ready to say that she should be the one you vote for yeah i think uh i think it's for a few reasons number one i think um they feel like they would lose credibility with their supporters or their audience, number one. Number two, I think it's also, it would be a tacit acknowledgement that the party that they championed for years, for decades, because Brett Stevens is uh, a conservative writer. Um, he has certainly been more Republican leaning his life than Democrat. Now to, to give him credit, he has been a critic of Donald Trump since Donald Trump entered politics. So I'll give him credit there. But you know, imagine, it's almost like, I, I, I'm not the world's biggest sports fan, but imagine that you spent all your life, you know, rooting for a particular team and then finally coming to terms with the, the fact that your team sucks and actually their rivals have been better this whole time and are more worthy of your support. I imagine that's part of the process too. And then, yeah, it's just, um, you know, it, it draws attention to you and, 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 and makes people, you know, try to go out of their way to court you. It's ridiculous. And I'll also say, during that episode of Real Time with Bill Maher, um, at one point, Brett Stevens suggests that, you know, uh, uh, people shouldn't, um, the reason that people shouldn't refer to Trump as a threat to democracy is because uh, he will, uh, you know, it plays into his hands. It doesn't matter if it's true, Luke, it, it's going to play into his hands. And so think about this. He's simultaneously saying, don't tell, don't do the, tell the truth. Don't do what's right because it's politically inexpedient. Telling the truth about Trump will help Trump. But when it comes to doing the politically expedient thing to defeat Trump, which is vote for the opponent, he won't do it. You see what I'm saying? Political expedience matters here, mm, mm. but not in the other respect. There's a dissonance. And it's so interesting to me that in one area, he's willing to sacrifice principle. Don't tell the truth because it will politically help Trump. But I'm not willing 
to sacrifice my pride and vote for a Democrat, even though that would be the politically expedient thing to do to defeat Trump. You see what I'm saying? I absolutely. And I guess a message to anyone who considers themselves moderate Republican or sort of in the middle, know that you can favor because of the facts a party without being blindly partisan right you can you can understand in this political moment i'm going to be voting down ballot democrat that's just that's just what i'm doing and that's because of not blind partisanship but where the facts point and you can even voice that voice your severe aggressive preference of vice president kamala harris as president and still acknowledge where she goes wrong still acknowledge what she could be doing better oppose certain policy proposals for someone like brett stevens she'll or he'll oppose a lot more of hers than someone who's more liberal but he can still say she's the one i'm voting for you should vote for her as well and then keep criticizing that's perfectly acceptable i think though josiah because people and this is totally justified have this fear of just being another sheep to a party sheep to one leader because we see where that leads they end up not realizing the importance of explaining in electoral politics, often you have two options and you need to go out there, motivate people to vote for one of them with their flaws. No, 100 percent. And listen, I've, I've taken it even further, especially as we've gotten closer to the election. I've been very clear on my show and on Twitter, and this is just my opinion. I would argue if you're an eligible voter, I would argue that you have a moral obligation to vote for the better option or the least harmful option, however you want to phrase it, because the result's still the same. Um, if you think that Donald Trump is what he is, then it, it, it by I just think you have a moral imperative to vote for Vice President Harris. Now, whether or not that will persuade people, whether or not people agree or disagree, uh, that that's up to them. I will also point out that uh, you know uh, a progressive commentator that um, I'm a huge fan of, and I believe you are as well. Mehdi Hassan to me is kind of like the stalwart example of this because he's been a persistent and outspoken, relentlessly outspoken critic of the Biden Harris administration over its Gaza policy. And yet, Luke, at no point has he, and not only has he not created a false equivalence, he has refused to indulge false equivalences between Trump and Biden, Trump, and Harris. He is a persistent critic of that as well. And so imagine, like, you, you, can, you can justify this however you want. No one's asking you to pretend that the Democrats are perfect. No one is asking you to forego your principal disagreements with the Democrats. We are asking you to recognize that some principal disagreements are worth more than others. And in the case of somebody like Brett Stevens, who says he's a conservative and has certainly presented himself that way, Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's an authoritarian. He is a threat to democracy. And I'm sorry, but that trumps, pun intended, policy disagreements that you have. And this is why I really respect what Liz Cheney has done, despite my um, criticisms of her longstanding support of Trump, is she recognizes that true. She almost certainly disagrees with Vice President Harris on the vast majority of policy issues, but she recognizes that she may have to endure four to eight years of that, um, but it's worth rebooting the Republican Party and getting them away from the authoritarianism of Trump. Mm. And Adam Kinzinger, too, speaking at the DNC, that was something else. I got teary-eyed about that it one. Was, it was fire. It was awesome. Uh, just quick, as I know we go so long, but just the quickest of things, because you brought up Mehdi Hassan, some people might go, okay, well, I might vote then for Jill Stein. If you're thinking Ooh. of voting for Jill Stein, there's a little interview you could watch with Mehdi Hassan that uh, was was rough. Did you see, too, she didn't know in that uh, Breakfast Club interview how, how many, many members of, of Congress... What? How, you're running for president? Come on. Luke, she's only running for president of the United <laughs> States, okay? She's not running for Congress. Why on earth would she need to know? Next, you're going to ask her how many branches of government they are. there oh, are. Gosh. I mean, what, what's what's next, Luke? What other trivia do you expect a, you know, a president to know? Like, so I mean, ridiculous. So I will say it is. Yeah, I will say that when uh, people watch that interview, and they should, they should also watch my interview with Mehdi Hassan, by the way, which is a dream come true. Um, they need to prepare themselves for um, like burn exposure because he is Mehdi Hassan is on fire in that Jill Stein interview, as you well know. It is it is brutal. <laughs> yeah, it is it is brutal. All right, we will yeah. leave it there on that. Josiah, where can people follow you? YouTube.com slash Pondering Politics. Luke, I appreciate uh, the collaboration as always. You're the man.